from label Ritu Kumar and uh, a person who's been at the Kolkata Literary Meet from its very first session and is of course one of the greatest warriors for the, the thing that's called textile tradition, Darshan Shah. And I will be in conversation with this amazing panel. So, uh, thank you very much for making it here. And uh, are you out in the sun or are you all right? I'm so very fine. Okay. <laughs> You've come from Jaipur, where I'm sure it's much colder, so the sun yeah. won't feel so bad. So warm. Yes. It's almost nice to have a little sun. Right? Yes, and you're coming from Delhi. What can I even say? So, uh, I think I'll start from the lady who's come from Delhi. Oh, the session is called Fabric of Freedom, and uh, you know, there's a great evocative link between freedom and. Uh, the hand spun. So we keep reading about Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav and uh, you personally told me that we want this session to be celebratory rather than uh, you know a session that's under a pall or a cloud of concern and uh, you know worries about the sector. So what are the happy things to celebrate about Handloom and the Handmade today? Well I think there's quite a lot which doesn't mean that we shouldn't forget that handloom is under threat and many sort of things. But to be pessimistic about it, I think, is wrong. We need to remember what is wrong, but we need also to see that a lot is right. And that um, I think that one of the things that we ignore because we see with love and regret a lot of cherished fabrics which are no longer as good as they were, but I think we forget that in the last 25 years or so, there's the emergence of all kinds of fabrics that our mothers, even though they were dedicated handloom sari wearers, didn't see. I mean, we have uh, revivals of so many things. We have many tribal saris like Kotpat and Bomkai, which have emerged and which are available in the urban space. We have um, saris which we didn't even know that we could make. Perhaps in West Bengal, lovely jamdanis, which we used to call dhakai, but we now can call Kolkata jamdanis, as Darshan is wearing. We have the wonderful invention of the sari, which was never there before, which is the bhujori sari, which emerged from a thick cotton shawl, and which now is the craze of India and everyone's writing on Instagram, you know, I want a bujori, I want a bujori. And the weavers in bujori are completely taken aback. And the other weavers in Kach who also make the same sari are very cross because it's been given this name bujori and say, we also weave this. So lots of things like that. So many lovely Bengal weaves, the Begampuri, the uh, Shantipur, all those saris being made again. I saw very, very nice Tangail saris again, which had disappeared. We have our friend here producing beautiful saris. And I think you're wearing one, aren't you? Why wouldn't I? <laughs> yeah. So uh, there's a lot to rejoice about. But there's also a tinge of regret that the people who weave it still aren't getting the benefit of their extraordinary skills. And we need to question that. And rather than say that, oh, everything's wrong and, you know, there's no place for handloom weavers in India today. We need to remember that there's very much a place for them in the market. So why isn't there a place for them in our homes and in our institutions and as a voice in policy so that we can make things better for them? Yes. Just to ask you further, uh, you said there's this concern and some weaves are uh, disappearing. Uh, you run this iconic bazaar, which has been there for many years. I remember when we went for our first Bailum exhibition a decade ago, we bought lots of stuff and, you know, sold it here. So uh, when you, you know, with, with the, digital, uh, you know, the digital revolution, a lot of these weavers, too, are more empowered. Yeah. How do you think technology is helping 
rather amazingly yeah. these weeks. Well, I think it's uh, affecting them in two ways, and both of them are positive. One of uh, is that things like Instagram and all that give them a direct access to their buyer, and they're no longer strangled by a middleman or an exploitive uh, exporter or whatever. They also know the prices at which their products are selling, which gives them a bargaining point. But I think the most exciting thing for me is to see what uh, the digital space has done to the creativity of handloom weavers. Because now they're there, they can access Google, they go on to Pinterest, they look at things that are happening. Um, you know, uh, the young craftsperson, uh, weaver f from Kutch, whom I know, and he, uh, because when you see something suddenly for the first time, it hits you in a way that we blase types just take for granted. And he rang me a couple of years ago, and he said, uh, Benji, Laila Ben, Mane Jackson Pollock they hai, you know, on, I think, on Pinterest. And he made these saris, these Ajwak saris. He was an Ajwak uh, block printer. And he made these amazing saris where the pallos and the borders were absolute classic Ajwak. But in the middle was this explosion of color and splashes and things. Really a Jackson Pollock, you know, as a canvas, using the sari as a canvas. And they were extraordinary. So things like that happen. Sometimes they get it very wrong. Uh, a Kanjeevaram weaver came the other day to show me with great pride that he'd done a pallo which had 25 portraits of Prime Minister Modi in different headgear, you know, which I told him was not a good idea. But, you know, it's all happening and it's happening out of their own heads. It's not because someone has told them, hey, aaj kal ye bazaar mein bikega or whatever. So that's great, I think. That's wonderful. So all kinds of things all can kinds happen of through are happening. Yeah, the good news and the yeah. interesting news. So Bappa, uh, I'm coming to you one by one. So Bappa, uh, Leila said that uh, it's uh, interesting to see that, you know, modern, uh, there's an exposure and uh, there is a sense of a world that they were not familiar with now being accessible. Now, you are one of the people who have worked for more than no, two decades at the very least with weavers and uh, you have kind of been at the intersection of traditional practices and interventions which make them understandable and attractive to newer, younger buyers. So how do you straddle traditional textile traditions and uh, modern design requirements? Um, I, I think uh, th this will take me back to when I actually started the work uh, way back in 2000 when we, where the juncture was that the Bengal handlooms was undergoing a transition where the, the traditional stuff, they were not having enough market for the amount that was being produced at that point of time. And so the group of weavers that I came across with and I met at that time I almost felt a need that another market has to open up for them rather than the traditional market which is, was still there and running for them but it was not giving them enough um, um, I mean it, it wasn't being able to support uh, their livelihood enough and there had to be a newer market with newer products uh, which uh, would give, give them a fresh life. So that is the point from where I started and that was the need to uh, research and uh, work on newer textures. Uh, so my work if you see uh, from day one has been working on new textures, mixing different yarns. Uh, that has been my forte and th that has been I think my contribution uh, back to the community where it's because of that probably our, my saris kind of stood out and became a brand on its own. Uh, like even in the villages, if you go, they say it's a Bailu sari, although it's not my sari, but, 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 but it's a Bailu sari. So anything experimental that they do, they try and name it that way. Because probably we were at that point of time in Bengal, probably the first to kind of work with textures. Because Bengal handlooms always had that flat 100 by 100 counts or a silk, uh, mar I mean, mulberry by mulberry. But no one really experimented with the textures and uh, bases. So we, my idea was to create new bases so that the fabric itself stood out and 
demanded a new market, became more contemporary. I think weaving of sequins, printing of the warp, everything kind of contributed to that uh, empty um, market because, of, because which was probably there, but no one really addressed to it. And also I felt, uh, like Lila said, that it has to come into our homes. Craft has to come into our homes. And I strongly feel that handlooms has to be worn on an everyday basis, otherwise it's not going to survive. It cannot be one party sari that you wear to or a kanjivaram you wear to a wedding that will not survive the entire handloom industry. Handloom has to be worn and used on an everyday basis like the way it used to be done. So the huge amount of uh, people who wore handlooms on an everyday basis, basically teachers or professionals, who at that time I saw were, not, were shying away from saris because they found it cumbersome to wear every day in the morning to drape a sari and go to the office. And we kind of addressed to it by working on the drape of the sari. So the drape had to be very easy. It had to uh, not crease throughout the day. It has to stay the way it is so that they could easily in that same sari go to an office and then go to not a Not necessarily evening. be starched. Yeah, and starching, taking out the starch from, from the sari. That's, I think, we, we did. And we made the sari more wearable, more drapeable, and easy to drape. Not wearable, more drapeable. Uh, and so I get a lot of, a lot of people tell me, so now the first thing when they open the cupboard, the, their hand I mean, goes out and to our saris because it's very easy to drape. So they find it. And I've always figured that Indian women have always loved wearing saris. I, there was never a dearth of the love that they have towards the saris. But it was at that point in time they didn't find that exact sari material which would actually go with their uh, working uh, en environment. So I think our contribution has been there where we uh, filled in the blanks and uh, gave a, a sari or a textile which was more wearable for the current times. So uh, as Bapa said that, you know, it's, it's a journey. It always is. So it starts with what was a traditional weave and, the, uh, and, and is seen as classic and now has all these associations with our freedom, our independence. And today, there's a different kind of requirement. But uh, it's important to chronicle all of this. So besides you know, being in the retail space with your amazing Weaver studio, you've also been very passionate about chronicling and uh, you know, getting uh, old textiles and making them museum pieces. And this desire to memorialize the textile tradition and keep it alive, how, how did that happen with you, Darshan? Thank you for having me here. It's her and debut uh, on stage, but she's yeah. been here 11 years. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, the journey for me has been uh, more than about 30 years. I came from a completely different background of textiles. I came from an academic background of being a BCom, a lawyer, and a MBA. And uh, my, um, I, I didn't study textiles at any point of time. Uh, I just came to be in the business of textiles because uh, when I came into the business of textiles, it was, was need-based. It was not really want-based. And so I had to really study textiles to be able to grow the business. So I went to various uh, masters like Ruby Ghaznavi, who sadly passed on uh, four to five days ago. She was a guru to me, to Sheila Balaji, to Chandramauli ji, to many, many people. And in some sense, natural dyes uh, attracted me. And uh, I found that there was a gap there. And I also found that there was a large gap in uh, very beautiful uh, hand block printing as it was, it was receding. It was going away. There were fewer and fewer hand block printers in our city. Shirampur used to be there. Then in Kolkata, we had of course, Ritu Kumar, which went into screen printing, etc. And we have Konishko and others. But the hand block printing and it's uh, uh, the blocks, the traditional blocks, the batik technique, uh, all of this uh, kind of I learned on the job and uh, was inspired by all my teachers and gurus who were extremely generous. And they started my journey to travel. And the travels taught me how important it was to document. Everywhere I went, I found this uh, tradition of uh, uh, documenting and of uh, putting it in the public domain by publications or by keeping reserved textiles, etc. And I found that uh, going to our museums or going to our 
um, you know, the craft museum or the national museum or Sanskriti or the Indian museum in Calcutta or elsewhere, we only got to see what was displayed in the gallery. We never got to see anything that was uh, the masterpieces that were in fragile condition, which were in the reserve collections. So I decided that if we do need to uh, produce as of today and go forward, we have to go back in history. So I decided that history was something that I was enjoying and it was my strong point and that's how the journey started of uh, travel, of meeting masters, of learning, of uh, photography, documentation and organically I collected about 1500 books which is a library now at Viva Studios uh, Trust and about 1000 textiles so that uh, this all happened organically, there was no plan so it's not that I have only textiles from Bengal but we've put together textiles from all over the world where we could do comparative studies, we could study specifically and we could learn from it and we could actually take designs and reproduce it in the contemporary sense, in the contemporary colors, in the contemporary textiles, fabrics, etc. So this journey has been extremely enriching. It's not that I don't, uh, uh, I don't do contemporary textiles. We do contemporary textiles, we do experimental textiles. We uh, work with across the borders. We don't think uh, that uh, working specifically in India is something that I want to do all the time. So I definitely go beyond borders. And for me, craft has been beyond borders. So I worked a lot in, uh, as you can see, in Jamdani. I worked a lot uh, in Khadi in, and uh, spinning. So a lot of the spinning and the Khadi spinning that we do in West Bengal. We take it across and send it across and this is where I'll come to the important point of the policies that the government needs to address is we take it across by hand. You know, there's no, no writing, there's no official export, nothing because of the policies of the governments between the two countries which have imposed such huge taxes that the sari wearers are as many in India as in Bangladesh, depending on, I'm not talking about the large numbers but in proportion and uh, um, uh, they keep smuggling these saris. We smuggle Jamdanis from there and they smuggle the Banarasis and Kanjivarams from here. So I feel that there is such a huge opportunity for addressing at the policy level, be it uh, um, this, um, uh, this point or be it the point of uh, um, the, uh, the government at the, at the textile ministry to address all these points of whether it's the polyester flags or it's the hand loom or the hand, hand, hand made textiles and all of it and the support, the subsidies, the, like she says, it has to be a positive session. So yes, it is a positive session, but we do have to look at what we can do to so make it a better space for at the grassroots to start with and then at all levels where, peop, where our uh, next generation is encouraged to join this field of hand loom. So that's my point and if I don't document and present it in the public domain and keep it going, whether through publications, through exhibitions, through effort, through seminars, through uh, workshops, etc., then a lot of this is getting lost. So it's oral histories also that I'm recording. And the next, the project after Baluchar, which was shown in Kolkata, had two publications and was shown at the National Museum. The next project that I'm doing is Textiles of Undivided Bengal and what really impacted them. And the main thing it, that impacted them was what is impacting today our industry, our handloom handcraft industry. Wonderful. So uh, the baby of the session, <laughs> who actually was born in Calcutta, if I'm not. <laughs> That's the second non-shaving dig I've heard today. <laughs> and it's only 12. <laughs> So uh, Amrish uh, has this legacy of, uh, he's, he's literally born to textile. So label Ritu Kumar, which, uh, you know, the, the, the prints which Darshan spoke about, which, was so, which are so iconic. I remember I used to earn 3,500 rupees in my first job in 1995. And I saved a little money and borrowed a little and bought a nice salwar kameez from Ritu Kumar. And I think I still have that. So, you know, to create such an iconic brand and to celebrate a, a very important part of our textile tradition, which is the print. And now you have brought in label Ritu Kumar. And uh, so it's leaving that legacy a little and trying to speak to a, a new audience that is, uh, th that is exposed to the world. So how do you balance the traditions that are so inherent 
to Indian design with the desire to cater and speak to a generation that is exposed to designs from all over the world and to fashion trends like in real time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I think, uh, firstly, I, ju I just want to caveat this by saying my experience is more than, is not so much handloom, but uh, the association of craft. And craft goes across various traditions of embroidery and print, etc. Um, I think just to pick up on what Lalaji said in the beginning, I think th things have changed today in a way uh, that they weren't 10 years ago, uh, with respect to essentially consumerism and the uh, affection or the importance or the uh, slant that the new consumer or the moneyed consumer, whatever, what have you, towards a more sort of traditional um, interpretation of craft, uh, a, an aesthetic, for want of a better term. And I think there has been a significant change, I would say even in the last five years, to attaching value to that. Uh, it is a combination of I mean, obviously, it's driven by market forces, by the uh, propensity to consume, the strength of the economy, and what have you. And that has, fortunately for us, and this is something that I've been hearing since I was a child from my mother, is that we uh, in India have a unique uh, attachment to our aesthetic, that perhaps other, uh, other countries that have become prosperous over the last three or four decades did not or do not or did not have uh, did not have a heritage of and as we are becoming more wealthy uh, as our taste to consume are changing i think there is as you mentioned instagram and things like that there is a move back to that inherent original um, aesthetic and that's uh, that comes from our craftspeople so I think that's an extremely positive. Uh, that's extremely positive for what we are talking about today. However, I don't think, and at the risk of sounding a little bit contrarian here, uh, because I'm enmeshed with market forces, I'm trying to create brands that sell, that have scale, and so on and so forth. Uh, I think the more I see it, I've always believed that the idea of the craftsman. Uh, both the imperfections and the individuality of what they create is a luxury. Um, and we cannot, at least the way I see it, I, I don't think we can go back to the time when those craftspeople, whether it's handloom, etc., can be an everyday product. At least, of course, it can be an everyday product, but I don't think it can uh, become, it, it has to remain in the slightly more, for want of a better term, the luxury end of our consumer spectrum. Uh, that is the only way that the uh, correct um, value is given to the craftsman himself. Uh, and I think those times of having handlooms that were for everybody every day have moved because of technology and what have you, and people are dressing differently. I think sarees, other than two parts of the country, are not really worn uh, as ubiquitously as they used to be. So we have to accept that change. And handloom and craft more and more must pay obeisance to the tradition of uh, the father to son, the tradition of the uh, craftsman's um, eye on the imperfection and why that makes it beautiful. So uh, w what you're saying is that perhaps the Shantipuri cotton, which is for five, which, which is, you know, maybe just a thousand or a little more will therefore not have there's no reason to buy it because uh, it's it's not it's hand it's hand woven it is clearly beautiful but it is not luxurious so uh, then are we going to you lose a large uh, swath of fabric out in our from our traditions it's already happening well, I, mean, I don't put words in my mouth. I don't, I don't know. No, I'm <laughs> asking, is this... So what is the solution? Yeah, what he's trying to say in his baby way is that we need to find new uses for fabric. We needn't assume that every handloom has to be a sari. And things change. And I think that actually I agree with him because uh, I think there is a misconception 
especially among the young consumer, that if they want to wear handloom, they have to dive into a saudi. And that's so not so, that handloom can adapt itself to many uses, both to wear as well as in your home. And, you know, a Shantipur sari will make the most beautiful blinds in your house. And you don't necessarily have to take it down and wash it and start it every single time you hang them up. So I think that that way we need to get away from some of these sort of knee-jerk reactions. And I also think that we have to remember that if we want handloom to be used in many forms, it has to also change. Just as Bapa was saying that he introduced texture in a lot of weaves which traditionally didn't have them. I think for the cut garment, not every sari tradition can be cut up and made into a kurta pajama or dress. It has to be worked. The loom has to change slightly technology of the weave has to change slightly. And I think that we sometimes put the cart before the horse. We think that, okay, here's the sari. It's not selling. So let's, you know, hand it out. We have to look at how that sari was woven, what it needs to adjust to be put to a new use. Uh, a lot of very traditional tribal saris, which were very thick, have now been, like Kotpat, for example, or the Udipi saris, have been made much finer. Sometimes I feel they've almost lost something in the process. And we need to say that if there's a beautiful coat part or a bomkai, I mean, it need not be made absolutely thin and lose a lot of its character, but we can think of a new use for it and a new way even for wearing it. Because the young today are being so creative in the way they wear saris and the way that they um, partner it with different types of blouses and things which used to be one of the big bugbears that, oh God, I'd love to wear a sari, but I have to get blouses made. And now they wear all kinds of blouses and sometimes they don't wear blouses at all. And terrific, you know? So I think that just as weavers have learned to be creative and innovative, I think the consumer and the merchandiser has to be creative and innovative as well. Okay, so uh, I'll come back to uh, Darshan. Uh, you mentioned archiving these. Therefore, if we are going to be uh, moving from original traditions, your role is important, even more important, if I may say so. So we have to have somebody archiving the original coat bar and the original, uh, the original kanji varam and all the fabrics which are now deemed thick and or short. A lot of the Banarasi saris were woven short. Yes. So. Uh, while this is important, the need, like Amri said, of uh, accepting that a certain kind of uh, requirement of our traditional weaves is going to slowly diminish, is, does that make it even more challenging? And are you now working at a speed that is, you know, you, you can see some things disappearing and is there a sense of a frantic uh, uh, collecting of items and archiving Yeah, there is, there is a fantastic like, of sense that I go to Ruby Dee and say, Ruby Dee, you're 93, happy birthday. Yesterday was a birthday. And I say, all the saris she's that you here, have, right she's right here. Front, and yeah. she's one of the greatest Dis icons in yes. the city when it comes to anything that's handmade, handwoven, hand embroidered. Right, right. So she's worked in the field for about 70 years and... Uh, um, I keep going to all the seniors to tell them that, uh, or, my, or my buyers, you know, they have fantastic collections over the years who used to wear fantastic saris, and tell them, and I request them that, please, just let me photograph them. And I've done more than 50 saris photography of Ruby these saris, and of all kinds, which are mainly Bengal, because that was my interest first, and then uh, the other, other saris too. So yes, it's really been a, it's, it's very exciting that now I'm doing this undivided Bengal, and before this, I managed to find 300 baluchers from different collectors, private collectors, museums, and, um, and uh, weavers, and their homes, and fragments. And it was like uh, unbelievable that I could document them. And now I have about 40 jamdanis in the, from different parts and different areas and different designs. Even the mango, the kolka, the paisley, there are more than 100 paisleys that we have documented. And because it's very delicate and we can't keep opening up the saris often, we've started to make rumals. 
So rumals are getting documented so that you can get the archol, you can get the konia, you can get the border, and you can get the body of the sari. And as you see, I'm wearing a swatch card. So these are seven natural dye colors in which we've just uh, done a swatch card. And yesterday, they quickly put tassels on two sides and said, go wear it. So it's that you're constantly documenting and so you're constantly... Darshan has friends in good places. Yeah. And, but it's extremely important that uh, I, um, I feel it's extremely important that I should be able to do the work that I'm doing. At the same time, I don't want to come to this funding part, etc. But uh, I have to keep my business going, the commercial aspect going. And I actually sell handloom as luxury. And I charge handloom as luxury. And thank you to all my buyers, whereas charge handloom as luxury. Because then only that percentage of the profits goes to my other work, which is a not-for-profit work from the bottom of my heart, from passion. And uh, all the photography, documentation, publications, exhibitions, workshops, seminars, the back and forth, all of it comes from the fact that handloom is luxury. Okay, I think Laila wanted to just add something. Yes, when I heard this word documentation, so crucial. Because we have to remember that weavers and other craftspeople can't afford to keep samples. They've often not even seen what their fathers made, yep. let alone their grandfathers. So documentation is crucial, but equally crucial is seeing that that documentation is accessible to the craftspeople themselves. Yes. Because we see it as a coffee table book or we see it in a museum, they don't. And I know from the experience of taking craftspeople to a museum or to a collection or an exhibition is like switching off not one tube light, but all the bulbs in their heads. And they rush back and say, that's our tradition. That's what we can make. Instead of yes. saying, when you do a scribble, say, nahi, wo to nahi ban paiga aaj kal. You know, they realize it can be yeah. hard. Uh, Leladi, I've just so, put everything I'll in the just, public yeah, domain. Yeah, I know. She's amazing yeah. and she's always very kind with giving me whatever is she's doing. So thank you for that. So Bappa, as uh, you work very closely with craftspeople. And uh, what is their engagement with, uh, their, uh, with traditional design? And uh, how do they react when you come, with a, come up with a challenge? Uh, as Lila said, that actually they they never think unless they see things, and actually they are so market market driven because they keep trying to sell whatever they are making. So they are always making for the market. I mean, hardly they ever sit back and think, okay, l let me try and revive something. So it's mostly from people like us who kind of encourage them to re revive things by by giving them an old photograph or a. I mean, I mean, cutting cutting of a sari, and uh, they do it plainly for making a profit rather than trying to uh, do it for the love uh, love of it. Very few I've seen are act actually passionate about reviving, but mostly they do it because we are they are being told to do it because they they are going to make some money. But I've also seen in terms of I I would. Um, uh, there was there's one part of my work which is export and we would do scarves at that point of time where we started our business doing scarves but when we switched over to saris when our business became more of saris I saw that happiness in them because they were more comfortable with the form because they've always been used to weaving saris because scarves they would think whether it's a baby sari whether it's something they couldn't really make out what was what they were doing but when they started weaving saris whether it was modern I mean, weaving sequins inside was something they got shocked when I said the letters weave the sequins inside. But once they got the hang of it and they realized that it was giving them more market share, it was making the sari more uh, sellable, everybody jumped, jumped onto it because ultimately they want to sell and make some money. And for me, that is why where I stand maybe a little differently than Darshan or um, him that... Uh, it cannot be just looked at a, as a luxury product but, but, but because it's a question of millions of weavers, who, uh, their livelihood. But I always see it from that, that point of angle because my whole journey, my reason of starting was that. And I, I always look at it from that angle and I feel that if we can make it a little cheaper or make a little less profit and distribute it in more, I mean, Indian population is huge and even if a 
I mean, minuscule population uses handloom on a daily basis for their needs. I think we don't need to worry about it at all. Yeah, so I'll come back to Amri from the point of, you know, this explosion that has happened with online retail. And uh, it's, it's a great opportunity. But uh, if you're working with hand embroidery and, uh, you know, items which need to be, uh, you know, made one piece at a time, it's also a great challenge. So label Ritu Kumar has actually set a kind of a print, uh, a kind of a template, let's say, for many others in this field to, you know, follow. So how have you been able to marry the uniqueness of uh, Indian design with the requirements of online retail? You know, online retail isn't, is, is just retail. Uh, it's just there's another place to sell what you're trying to do. And the bigger the market gets, the more they go online because it's, in, it's more accessible. So I don't think online retail uh, is necessarily um, the determining factor here. But just to go back to what we were saying uh, about marrying the, uh, and, and uh, Bapa. Bapa, the, what you're talking about is the, the everyday use of, of uh, handloom. Now, I'm not trying to suggest that these pockets don't exist and will not continue to exist. They'll always be dilchasps. But I'll tell you one of the problems that we've been having for many years, and it's more pronounced now. Well, it's a two, it's a two part problem. One, we are not finding enough of the type of craftspeople we used to find. The, uh, the, the younger generations are moving out into other fields. And the only reason they do that is they're not being able to, as you said, make the profit or you know, f find a living because the, through that value chain, you know, the, um, uh, the, the money's not going all the way down. That's one problem that we're facing. And the other problem is the loss of the very fine crafts. There are people doing embroideries, there are people doing zardozis, there are people doing chicken curry, there's people doing all kinds so of things. Do you all work with families across generations? And have you seen young people leaving the family? Yeah, very much so. Traditionally, we worked with, um, I remember one of the early stories that my mother had was these boys used to come on the top of a bus from um, yeah, Beliaghat, to Beliaghat or from the, the villages way out. And they then became um, the businesses in their own right. But their children are not following the footsteps of their, of their fathers and their grandfathers and what have you. And through that process, you're losing that, uh, the finesse of the craft that we used to have. So again, I, you know, I, I go back to that, that until they're getting the kind of wage that they will, or the kind of livelihood that they will um, from opposing the options, they're not going to continue doing it. And that's why I think the handmade process like even the Serampur printers that you're talking about, the, uh, the, work, the working population there in the last 10 years has shrunk to about 20% of what it used to be. That's a huge reduction. And you know, they used to romantically talk about the waters of the Hooghly and how they used to certainly have a certain type of color that you cannot replicate. They're doing true? digital machines now. I mean, it's the, color, color. the colors of the Hooghly. Yeah. You know, it makes it a certain patina. Of course there is, but <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the romanticism of it. But it's a lovely story, and that romanticism has to, will only be, in my mind, sustained if we are able to pay them the value of what it takes to create those 26 screens for one uh, lappa. You know, and it's it's a huge process, and there's a lot more competition now. So that that was my point about it needing to be a little more upscale. So I think that brings us to the not so celebratory part of the conversation, which is when such challenges confront uh, a, 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 tra a, a traditional, uh, an industry that's steeped in history, it is the policy makers who have to step in, who have to subsidize, who have to fund, and who have to support in every form, from the craftsperson to the archivist, to people who are working in the, seg in the sector. So again, uh, this time I won't start with you, Laila. I'll start perhaps with Bappa. What do you think are the two things in policy that you would like to see that would improve our chances of, uh, like what Amrish mentioned, the, 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 the standards of expertise, that they'll, you know, they'll continue to be what they were? I think I'm not a very expert in talking about government policies because I've never followed them, neither I've really adhered or approached government for anything. 
but what i feel is the way we look at craftsmen is has to change like we put a lot of uh, burden on their shoulders as to it almost has to be a, a father to son kind of hand down expertise uh, why can't uh, colleges teach uh, hand loom and handcraft where people in general can take it up as a profession rather than the master printer's son has to print he might not want to print I mean, he, I mean, might have, have other uh, aspirations of driving a car or, uh, I mean, selling microchips. But then why does he have to take that burden of, on him to, to print or to weave? I mean, that, I think, is somewhere we, our country needs to expand uh, and make it more knowledge, more accessible to, uh, to, to everybody so that anybody who has an interest in it can pick it up and you i mean take it up as a warm up profession what would you like seeing uh, different in this uh, it's difficult to say i mean there is a good amount of uh, government subsidy that does go into d different craft areas uh, perhaps better distribution less leakage in the system would be good um, and also infrastructure i think I, for me the demand and supply have to marry closer without with fewer impediments in the process. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with private enterprise. I mean, there's only so much I think government can do. Um, but certainly education, I think, is a very, very good point. I don't know to, these, to the extent at which these design schools are actually delving into the, uh, the technique, the, the intelligence that actually flows through that I was fortunate enough to learn by osmosis. But I don't know how much of that actually goes on. We, we recruit people from design schools who don't really have a, much of a clue as to the kinds of things that you do, for example. They, it requires a huge relearning process. And those are the things that we could do that could make our, that ecosystem uh, a little less, uh, a little more fluid. Uh, that's yeah, I think uh, the government policy for distribution of yarn, instead of just giving most of it to the um, handloom, the, the industry that lands on power looms, they should definitely make it more accessible to the handloom weaver. The handloom weaver finds it extremely difficult because of price fluctuations as well as the accessibility to yarn consistently to do what he's doing or the orders that he has or the prices he needs to give and put. Uh, another thing is the skill development uh, centers need to be more focused and uh, result oriented. A lot of money is being spent, but what really is coming out of that has to be looked into. Um, the third point I'd like to say that handloom schools have come up everywhere, whether it's in Kutch or it's in Maheshwar or everywhere, all over India. People have started these handloom schools so that people besides the master crafts people and the traditional weavers and uh, embroiderers and other um, people's children, there are, it's open to everybody. No, so that's that exactly religion. my point. It is yes. only for the children of the craftsmen. No, but it's, it's not a, for the it's, public. Uh, no, it's for the public. So now they've opened, up, opened it up for the public. So I'm running the two skill Maheshwar development. The Maheshwar school is only for the children of the Yeah, but now the they've weavers. opened it up because uh, now that Sally and Richard are going to hand it over to their son, he's merging both Reva and uh, um, uh, Women Weave. And that's exactly my point is when I had this discussion with, uh, um, when I went to Maheshwar with Richard, that please kindly open, up, open it up to the entire uh, immediate surrounding, if not the state to start with, because of the communication and uh, coming, staying, facilitation, etc. So uh, definitely, I think if people uh, come together who are from the same field and ideate and say that, okay, these are the issues, let's address them together, let's work together. So initially when Sally came to us and said that, how do I teach my Maheshwar weavers to spin khadi? So we opened up a unit, sent two people across, and it's, it, it was an organic process. It is hand-holding, it uh, uh, it's extremely organic, and I definitely feel that uh, the government has to play a much larger role. They can't go randomly producing uh, uh, polyester flags in our 75, 75th year of independence. They should have prepared much better. It was going to be 75 anyway, even five years earlier. So why couldn't we produce a, whatever the, the whole, 1.3 billion flags, one for each person? That the government could have given. Another point that happened where all of them, all the craftspeople at the grassroots got flummoxed, and including my tailors and everybody, is when demonetization happened, and then when GST came in. So all this has got to be addressed in a manner where uh, it makes it easier for them rather than them completely engrossed in 100 things and then their children or 
the periphery says that no, 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 let's just get jobs in the city or let's go abroad or let's just do something else and we need, you know, two meals a day. Now, after COVID, it's just two meals a day. We can be just getting two meals a day and we're happy because what we are, what, what, what I see in my more than, four, I have 60 people on uh, salary and more than 400 people in the districts, etc., working. And uh, I, this is what I feel that Amra Jato Ji Pachi, Oita Judi Apna Barate Parin, Bhalo Achi Judi Nabaran, Tale Amra Onno Kach Amadeke Dekte Hobe. So I have also encouraged lots of my uh, embroiderers and weavers that you do this, but do try and get your second line of income also, whether it is spinning, it's, it's to do with like textile. Being an author, you need yeah. a second line of income. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, people, the authors in the, yeah. in the audience yeah. are concurring. So, Laila, you live in Delhi and you have been part of many things that have been stopped and many things that are starting. So, what is your view on policy? From trying to deal with government of India. Really, you're so, used to shouting at them because you always forget so the mic. So I am not going to get into what government of India because the list is as long as two arms. But I'd like to address all of us that what can we do? And to me, working with craftspeople now for almost 50 years, I feel that the reason that so many craftspeople are leaving the sector today and I think the figures are that we lose 15% of our craftspeople every decade. So you can just figure that out. Um, it's not only for economic reasons, because some of them are actually doing quite well these days. But it is the social position of craftspeople and weavers that uh, what do we say? You know, there was a time when every mother wanted her son and every mother-in-law wanted her son-in-law to be an engineer or a doctor. And imagine the shock if the daughter had come home and said, I bought a handloom weaver, I'm going to marry him. He would be maybe about a thousandth in the list of suitable professions. And I think that remains true today. It was true in 1947. It's true today. Uh, and yet, craftspeople are not some primitive form of occupation. They are highly skilled professionals. They can do things to, to lay an ikat warp is much more complicated than doing software programming. But do you give equal merit to these two professions? You do not. When I say this to friends that we don't give, you know, a craftsperson the social value they deserve, they say, oh no, we love craftspeople. You know, when I bought, I bought a beautiful sari the other day, and I had a lunch party to celebrate uh, the thing. And I said, did you invite the weaver? And they shock horror. No, they did not invite the weaver. And we wouldn't think of doing it, really. So until we change that attitude and realize that the craftspeople today are skilled professionals, they're not people to whom we do charity, it is not a question of just appreciating their craftsmanship. We should appreciate them as skilled professionals and our equals. And until we do that, the numbers of people leaving the sector every generation will just increase and increase. Super. So, uh, so just before I head out to the question part, the audience interaction, I want to know from each of you something very personal, which is, what made you all fall in love with textiles? So I'll start with the baby. Oh, I had no choice. I was, uh, I was born amongst it. It was always around me. Uh, since I was a kid, I was, I remember going to, uh, you know, when I was a seven-year-old, we used to drive out to the um, embroidery villages, and the craftspeople, they would make uh, chicken under the ground. I used to love eating that. So I was, I was born into it. So for me, it's uh, innate. I'm the wrong guy to ask this question. So this reminds me of uh, Bappa's daughter, who is also born into it. So uh, a few years ago, Bappa and Rumi told me that she was studying history. And then she came to the chapter on independence. And she said, Baba, ekhane o khadi. So yes, she, it's, it's not easy to run away from it if you're born into it. What about you, lawyer um, to yeah, textile? For me, it was a uh, choice between roti, kapda, makan. 
and I chose Kapra. For me, I think uh, my initial love, if I really look back now, was my mother's sari wardrobe. She used to open them up every winter to take out all her lovely saris, and that was probably my first real, real attraction towards it. But taking up as a profession, I think when I passed out from NIFT, I really didn't know whether I would take up hand, hand loom or handmade, handcrafted thing, or I would go into, because options, textile options is huge. But I think that my walk into that village and seeing those handlooms being dismantled and being sold off as firewood and not being able to sustain livelihood was the motivation which uh, probably got me into it. Well, I grew up with handlooms and handcrafts, my parents and my grandparents and so on. And it was also very much identified with the whole independence movement where to use, use Swadeshi things meant that you were really Indian. As a profession, it happened almost by accident. I thought I was going to be an artist with a capital A. I went to art school. I studied in Japan. But when I came back, I had to earn my bread and butter. I was very certain that I wanted to earn my own, pay my own rent. and. Uh, uh, so I started doing freelance assignments and uh, gradually discovered that I liked working with craftspeople and making things which were in a tradition and yet contemporary. I didn't like doing furniture which was stainless steel and glass and, you know, I liked using the crafts, but also that I felt that they needed a bit of a kick in the ass, they needed to contemporize themselves a little. And I enjoyed that process, and it went from there. Wonderful. I think that's a great time to now throw this open to the audience. Uh, we'll start, uh, since this is a textile thing, we'll start with the gentleman at the back in white. <laughs> so we should encourage men to engage in this. Fantastic talk. Um, one of the... Uh, one of the questions I've always had about textiles, uh, because our country's been so prolific and so famous for so long. When you look at some other countries, for example, um, trunk making in France became, Louis Vuitton became a pioneer, and maybe some trunks are not made in France, but Louis Vuitton still makes it. You look at Gucci and their work in design. The craft has become a luxury in which I, there was a little bit of discussion whether it should be luxury or not. I think it can be both. Of course. Of you know, course, Gucci course. can do it and also cheaper clothing can be made. But I don't know, maybe I don't know all the textile companies of India, but when you think of whether it's at luxury or at the discount level, which, you know, global brand is Indian, which global, you know, textile making company, maybe you're sourcing from India, you might have Orme scarves made by, you know, by loom, I don't know. But why is it, or Kashmir loom, but why is it not sold as Kashmir loom or by loom? Where are the Indian labels, the high and couture? Um, I think when you compare Italy to India, uh, the difference is if you look at the history of luxury goods, it's actually not that, it's not that old. But the idea of being something being luxury is, but a brand is, so there used to be individual artisans who used to have small shops, whether it's uh, the idea of Savile Row or it's the idea of Louis Vuitton, as you said. Uh, I think they had a uh, happy sort of uh, amalgamation of the emergence of consumerism in places like America and the association with Italy, etc., that enabled them to do it. Uh, we are in a different part of our uh, cycle of one consumerism and um, cultural impact around the world. Uh, I think in order for, say, someone like Savisachi who's now opened a store and he's uh, being lauded for him to become one of those labels is not uh, inconceivable. Uh, but perhaps the answer to your question is it's going to take a little time. Uh, we've got to have those in India first before we make that bridge outside India. And I do believe in India is beginning to happen. You're seeing uh, a lot of interesting labels that are coming out that have the moniker of that luxury, like whether it's raw mango with hand loom or 
uh, other people like that. I think the only caveat I would like to put on this, and there's something that uh, just before this talk, I was having a chat with Shabanaji, who was sitting over there, uh, and she was saying that um, the she patrons a, a ch chicken uh, embroidery belt in UP, and she says that the finest uh, exponents of that particular embroidery don't seem to be around anymore because they're using a slightly more when I say market, it's a, a sort of a, what they call chalu, a little uh, less fine way of doing that original work. We run the danger of losing some of the, the most sophisticated textile, for want of a better term. But your question is something I think about a lot uh, as well. I, I, I'm hoping it's a matter of time. OK, now we'll, uh, the lady in front. Uh, we are doing man, that. woman, man, woman. Oh, right. okay. Hi. Um, thank you for that session. I really appreciated uh, the candid discussion and the little bit of tension um, that was there between the speakers because this is such an important topic. A loom must have tension. Yes. Yeah. Uh, bring on those uh, puns. <laughs> Um, two things. One is, uh, thank you, Laila Ji, for naming the weaver. I wanted to name the weaver of the sari that I'm wearing. Her name is Shija. Uh, she's based in Kerala um, and uh, part of a weaver's co-op called Co-op Loom. We're just starting to organize weavers in, in Kerala, and one of the things they're doing is naming uh, the weaver. And I'd love a future panel to have a weaver on stage with you because, as you said, they are also designers. Uh, my question is more personal, and I don't know if it's that important. Um, basically, I wanted to name Shija. Um, but uh, I'm part of the diaspora. I live in the US, um, and there's two things that I struggle with. One is I hear my grandmother was um, poor. She didn't have a lot of saris. I didn't get a lot of hand-me-downs. But I hear lots of stories of, um, just the other day, there was a comment where all these amazing sharis from a long time ago that are just sitting in people's closets and people's wardrobes rotting away. Are there any ways to sort of rescue them? Um, I think people have an emotional attachment, so they're not always ready to give them up. I really appreciate the darshan, your work. And my second thing is, as a member of the diaspora, do we matter? And if we do matter, because we're so small and India is such a huge market. If we do matter, is there anything we can do to support uh, this work? So, and, and my name is Barnali. Thank you. Yes, definitely. I'd, I'd like to address the thing that, yes, definitely we should think about having the weaver. And also, uh, now the new, to, now the new uh, effort is to trace back exactly how that sari or piece of cloth was woven. Where really was the cotton grown? Where was it spun? Where was it woven? How did it come to that market and who bought it? So there is an effort to do that, but I think it will take some time because it's a huge line that goes right back and uh, communication networking uh, is still in its stage with the, with the grassroots and not the same uh, speed. That was one. Number two is when you talk about your, the saris that are lying in people's wardrobes, Yes, there are people who can help you do conservation to restore it or to keep it in a manner that would save it or if you could give it to uh, places in the public domain who are, who, who are able to, and you're able to share what you have in your cupboards which will never be seen by anybody, it will just disintegrate over time, that would be wonderful. That would be where the diaspora could come in and give um, to, in the public domain, various uh, beautiful textiles which uh, may be ongoing or may not be, but that could be a solution too. Okay, now I think Sri Vats. Thank you, Maladi. Uh, sorry, uh, thank you, panel, uh, for that really interesting uh, discussion. Uh, I have two questions, uh, one for the panel and the other for Ms. Taibji. Uh, but I'll ask the first more general question first. There's been a lot of talk in this last hour about um, Textile and luxury, but every time it is said that Darshan, for instance, said very proudly that she has made textile luxury. But the more expensive you make it, the, there are more and more and more and more and more women in India who do not belong to the upper classes, who perhaps can't afford it. What about them? Yeah, so we have different people for different jobs. 
So when I'm doing hand block printing and preserving 50,000 to 75,000 blocks, and when I'm uh, looking after uh, basic 40 but extended 600, 400 to 600 people in my extended family, there is a certain amount of uh, funds that are required at the end of every month for the kind of uh, operations I run. And the kind of handloom that I look at is of a different category, like I weave 300 counts jamdani, I weave 200 counts jamdani, nobody weaves those jamdanis, very, very, very few weave it. So yes, we do work on 10 colors, 16 colors, 12 colors, hand blocks, and uh, not talking about screens, or we look at extremely fine tie and dye techniques, or we look at extremely fine weaving techniques. Each technique, I mean, each piece of uh, sari that I weave in 300 counts takes two weavers one and a half years to weave. My cost is three and a half lakhs. Even if I give, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. So I am made for a different segment. There is a different segment that I have chosen to prioritize my work for. And then there is a segment that deals with the larger diaspora. It's not that I don't deal with the largest diaspora, but I find that there is a lot of gaps and blanks in the place where I am working. No, 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 no. Sorry, no, you, uh, you got my question wrong. I wanted okay. to say, what, yeah. about, what about farmers? What about women who work as domestic help? Yes, like yes. one of them to flaunt and strut around in a jamdani. That's the dream. That's the utopia. Well, it is mm. a utopia. It is a utopia. And I think you'll have to take that question yes. okay. outside. My, my, yeah. my, my last yeah. question Lela. to, uh, to Lelaji. Uh, it's such a pleasure to see you in person. Uh, flesh and blood, um, how do you kind of reverse aging the way you do? <laughs> well, I guess that the Calcutta sun gradually melting away my wrinkles is one way. <laughs> okay, uh, there are several questions. Uh, I'll take uh, the one from, uh, no, as I said, man, woman, Uma, I think is here. The lady in front. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my question is, having five distinguished uh, heavyweights from the textile industry or uh, creating things, um, how do we uh, stop the onslaught of terrible, inferior, cheap uh, Chinese yarn into every sector of our uh, woven uh, lives and uh, well, that, that's again, the government policy yeah. is very much uh, responsible for that. And also the production of Indian silks, especially the silks which come from China, is, uh, has gone into such depth of Indian handloom or handcraft industry that's almost impossible now. Now, if they really shut the borders, this industry is, I mean, going to fall flat on their face. So it's more of the government policies and encouraging more. Um, earlier, we used to have a lot of regional silk development boards and silk offices, which are all, de I mean, defunct at, at the moment. We were service centers too. Yeah. OK, um, gosh. Uh, now I'm just using young people, so this boy and uh, that young girl, yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It was really nice listening to you all. My question is, as we all know, fashion industry has a very big part in uh, contributing to the fabric waste. So could you show some, uh, show some light on it? I think Amrish, you can. Sorry, could you, could you repeat the question? Like the fabric waste is one of the largest waste oh, producing recycling. in the world. Recycling, so upcycling. Fashion Any industry. light on that? Well, it's a very big question. It's a fully different panel for that one. Okay, I so mean, upcycling anybody? Yeah. Look, we I think just traditionally, our, our handloom sector is, if you're talking about sustainability, yes. yeah, so I think our traditional handloom sector is one of the most sustainable industries that we have. I think the problem in the uh, clothing manufacturers, essentially you're talking about the fast fashion where you have huge amounts of waste. Uh, it's a different, I think it's a, almost a completely different industry. Uh, most of what in my experience, uh, the production of craft and handloom in India use, is traditionally very low carbon footprint and reasonably ecologically responsible. So another question, as a luxury brand, how do you reduce your carbon footprint? If you could just brief on it. That's roughly the same question. So 
So carbon footprints, how do you reduce? Use more yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just the, what this panel is all about. Yeah, Use also the effluents, you know, when we have effluents, uh, Effluent plants for for uh, you know we use dyes dyes but uh, we try to use all azo free dyes and non carcinogenic dyes when we do our block printing and dyeing or use natural dyes and that water is also recycled three times so all the water is recycled and all the waste that comes out of cutting and the leftovers we re we we make it into some product or the other and give uh, that uh, employment to. Uh, the simple batwa making or little bags making or quilting, jewelry quilting or quilting, etc. So we keep using up everything that we produce, number one. And then we try to use dyes and chemicals which are not harmful for the thing. And then we recycle the water. Okay, the lady there. Um, I'm Shweta. I've um, studied, uh, had the good fortune to study textile uh, design at NID Ahmedabad. So hopefully... Um, this question makes sense. Uh, somebody in the panel said uh, that, you know, the government is already doing what they can, which um, is like a big black box for us. But what we'd like to know is that uh, at a private uh, level, say for young uh, students and pass-outs, alumni, if we are stuck with textile or if we have uh, something that we'd like to work with further, why can't there be... Uh, with stalwarts like you, somewhere private, apart from uh, Darshanji's uh, center, of course, where we could approach and uh, have a common discussion or learn more about uh, the craft that we so want to sustain ourselves. Um, I think um, there's a certain lack of awareness about what is being done. So if you could just help us with that a little bit. So I, if I may answer this, so, you know, we have a store called Bailoom and uh, we've started a series of conversations called Spinning Yarns, where we are getting practitioners. We had a duo who came from Mura, the, the Mura, collective. Yeah, Mura Collective. Then we had a weaver who came from Odisha. There's a, there's a label called Vani Vritti. We plan to do some of these in February, March and right through the year where we have discussions and we showcase their wares at our store. And uh, I'm sure similar initiatives are taking place at stores in Jaipur and Hyderabad and everywhere because Dastakar, of course, is the gold standard in all these matters. But even in our city, we are trying to create forums. Of course, Darshan too has where we are uh, encouraging people to come and learn about new design techniques, traditional weaves, so on and so forth. So, you know, we all are batting on the same team. So there were, as uh, Bornali said, there was tension. But the fact is that I chose this panel because these are all people who are deeply concerned about textile and have great interests therein. And uh, yes, sorry for taking that question. It would be great if we would be more aware of it and yes. would know where to look out for. Follow, all our, follow us all on Instagram. <laughs> Yes, Shabana Ji. It was a very, very enlightening discussion. Thank you very much. As a former member of parliament, what really troubles me is that the government has so much money and so many resources, and it's such a sad thing that people prefer to stay away from government because they feel usme itna jamela hai ki usme kaun padega and i would like to give you an example of once i was with ritu kumar on a government uh, panel where they were um, uh, uh, they were judging uh, kanjivaram it was a national uh, award no brief had been given to the weaver okay no brief whatsoever he had paid 5000 rupees to enter that competition there was a beautiful kanjivaram sari and in the palla was rajiv gandhi's face this is their understanding of what national is now there is a big gap and i certainly believe 
that if people like you can get together and really make a policy paper about what things should be, then I can promise you we will get enough members of parliament to take it forward. But for that, you have to come together. You have to come together and understand how important it is to make a mark in policy. I know that Lala has been doing it forever, but I think if you people come and not give reams and reams of paper, but just with points, and then, you know, a lot can be done because questions can be put in parliament. They can go into the start session. There are lots of people who are doing that, and I think that would be a real help. Don't bypass the government because it's got a lot of resources. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, we are at now one hour, 15 minutes, and uh, she won't mind. So, uh, okay, I'll take two questions together, and then we'll answer. Okay. The gentleman there also has been steadfast. So, I'm sorry, ma'am, you can meet them on the sideline. Yes. I have two allied questions, actually. So what about the cautionness of uh, traditional design? Like nowadays, Kanjivarams look like Banarsis and vice versa, which bothers me a lot all the time. And the second one is the ownership of these designs, like the Sanganeri, uh, you know, kind of furor that happened. So how do we compensate these communities when someone as a big designer makes lots of money based on a particular design, like the Sanganeri print? We all know the... Yeah, yeah, Sabhi Sachi, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. More, I mean, I mean it sold for that. a huge sum of money, and maybe yeah. there should have been some payback to the community. Maybe it's not politically correct, but I'd really like to know what one can do about it. Okay, these are such loaded questions. We'll finish it and come to you. Anybody? About the, the authenticity of uh, Look, Banaras. You know, it's not just uh, Kanji Varam's looking like Banarsis. A lot of the Banarsi, what you think is ha what, what is being sold in the market is Banarsi is actually being made in China. There's a lot of Kimkha, etc. that's coming from China. And I mean, the only thing I can say is currently, uh, go back to what I originally said, that if the consumer gets more sophisticated with what they want, that is a solution to that problem because then they will know what they are looking for and what, where they want to source what they want. And it's, I think it's slowly beginning to happen. Uh, but this influx of whether it's yarn from China, etc., has been happening for decades. Uh, a lot of the stuff that we get shown by vendors actually trades people. And as far as the second point is concerned, I'm not exactly sure what the point is because, like, the my understanding is something like a Sanganeri block print is something that is uh, passed on by generations for hundreds of years. Who are you going to compensate? And what are we looking to do there? It is. Uh, uh, you know, a Jamawar Paisley has been there for thousands of years. What, what exactly is the opposition of someone using that art form? Okay, got it. Now that's the very last question, the gentleman there. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amar Damani. I own a printing unit, and we do uh, printing on textile, garments, and so on. So at various times, we are given assignments to do replicas of these traditional prints via digital printing technologies like sublimation and reactive printing. So I am at the crossroad whether it is helping the industry or the handloom people or we are cheating them by making the replicas of the same. Well, I'd like to take a little bit of the earlier question and a little bit of this. You know, I think the first thing is that the reason why a weaver from Kanjibaram with 500 years of tradition chooses to imitate a Banarsi or vice versa is because he's been brainwashed into thinking that that's what the market wants. We spend a lot of our time in Daska trying to explain to craftspeople that whether your particular skill is in fashion or not at this particular time, that is your strength. Your unique signature is your strength, it's your USP. And if you lose it, you will lose something which you can never recover. So it's much better to be creative and create beautiful things in your own genre rather than try and imitate something which you've seen, which you think is fashionable. Having said that, craft has to continually innovate. It's never been static. It responds to the market like every other consumer item there is. It is not an art form which remains frozen in time. 
as an example of this, if you show a Rabari woman in Kutch a piece of embroidery, she can date it up to a decade by the colors that the woman has used, the way the peacock has been portrayed, whether her tail goes this way, whether her beak goes this way. So we shouldn't think that, oh, there's some classic time when that particular craft was at its best. The technique might have been superb then, it may have deteriorated now. But as far as design goes, design is an organic thing, it has to evolve, it has to be, but that control should be in the hand of the person who makes it. It should not necessarily be dictated by either the market or a middleman. Um, the other point of whether a craft form or a design or a booty belongs to somebody. I mean, that's like people all over the world today wanting reparations for colonialism. You know, the people, we are here today for the British government to pay us for what the Raj did 300 years ago, I think is silly. We need to say that there were some good things and there were some bad things, and the more knowledge and the more innovation and the more creativity spreads over the world and belongs to all of us, the better. And I strongly believe that. I think that's an absolutely brilliant point at which to end this discussion. All the panelists are here around. I'll be meeting Amrish about his debut book and his other great love cricket later in the day at Birla Academy. Thank you. I really think the audience is so extremely distinguished that uh, we as the panel are truly grateful that you've been here. Thank you, Thank you. so very much. Mala, thank you for having all of us.